بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وأنم علينا يا عظيم رب الشح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قول أما بعد All praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and peace be upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I testify that there is no God except Allah Almighty and I testify that Muhammad is the Prophet and the Messenger of Allah and brothers and sisters with the last lessons of this great biography and life story of this great man Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which we are coming to a very close end to this seerah of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam that I ask Allah azza wa jal you had benefited from it and last we spoke about a very important expedition the expedition of Hunayn and learned a lot of lessons from that as the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum when they saw their number 12,000 of them a number that they never ever experienced before some pride came into their heart that the, this this number had never ever seen, been seen before and they've always won against enemies that the enemy always exceeded in their number but this time the Sahaba were a lot more in numbers but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to teach them a very good lesson that the victory of Allah does not come through numbers nor it comes through weapons nor that it comes through anything but and except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obviously that came after the opening of the conquest of Mecca which was a great historical moment to clean and purify the Arabian Peninsula from the worship of anyone beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify the Kaaba from the idols that people had made with their own hands and started to prostrate and bow to and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before he left Mecca he performed Umrah and then he set himself and the companions to go towards Medina back to their homes before we speak about that great event the battle of Tabuk let us speak about some important expeditions that took place before the uh, great expedition and the great battle of Tabuk in the ninth year of the Hijra in the month of Muharram at the beginning of the year the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam sent a troop led by Uyayna ibn Hist who had 50 horsemen to fight against the people of Tamim and the people of Tamim had tried to deceive other tribes against the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and stopped paying jizya which is the tax that's been set the levy that's been set upon the people of uh, the scripture or upon the people of the book that if they do not want to embrace Islam they can stay under the Islamic State under the condition that they pay a levy or pay a tax every year and don't think of that levy being too high it's equivalent of one dollar a year so you know the Christians and the Jews have the option to pay one dinar a year in return that they get protected and in return they get the full protection of a great state like the Islamic State and that Ayna ibn Husayn radiallahu ta'ala anhu will march during the night, sleep during the day until he arrived to the places and the towns of Tamim. He straight away ambushed them and attacked them and he took from them 11 men and 21 women and 30 children and brought them to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they also uh, divided the beauty amongst them then the family of Tamim came to uh, the, then the family and the tribe of Tamim came to free their families to free their captivities their captivities so they brought with them the most wisest and eldest of men 
And the, when they arrived to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi his house and they said, Oh Muhammad, please, we want to talk to you. Please free our families that Uyayna ibn Hussein had taken as captives. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, Meet me at the mosque at Dhuhr. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi prayed salat al Dhuhr there. And then the Arab had this custom that they love speech and poetry. They love speech and poetry. So what they did after Dhuhr, the, one of their main eloquent uh, speakers got up. His name is Utarid ibn Hajab and he spoke very well. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam asked Thabit bin Qais to get up and respond back to him. Then they had another poet, his name is Azurbqan bin Badr to get up and sing poetry. So the Prophet Sallallahu called upon Hassan, upon Hassan bin Thabit to sing poetry as a response to him. And then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after hearing that from them, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam was generous to them. He gave them some, uh, he gave them Alayhi Salatu some rewards and Alayhi Salatu Wasallam also gave them their family backs. He gave them their family back. Other expeditions took place, such as the expedition of Qutba bin Amir, al dahak bin Sufyan, al qama bin Mujazzir. And one important one that we'll talk about before the battle of Tabuk, an important expedition and this important uh, troop that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam sent was the troop of Ali bin Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu to destroy a major idol, a major idol that the tribe of Ta'i used to worship. And uh, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu was accompanied by 150 men. And he had 100 camels and 50 horses. And he had the flags with him and he went towards the tribe of Ta'i. There radiallahu ta'ala anhu managed to destroy uh, the idol that Ta'i had. And at the same time he, kept, he captured a lot of their uh, captivities and brought a lot of the spoils and a lot of the beauties back to Medina. Amongst those that he captured was the daughter of Adi bin Hatim al Ta'i. Hatim al Ta'i in the Jahili is to be known to be a very, very generous man. He was a man of generosity that when the Arabs speak about generosity, they always reflect, reflect back to Hatim al Ta'i. So when they speak about generosity, when they speak about you know, been generous, been nice, been you know, noble. They speak about Hat Hatim al Ta'i. And Hatim al Ta'i died, and he had two, he had children. Amongst them is Adi ibn, uh, ibn Hatim, in which Adi later on led his people. And amongst those that Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu caught and brought as captives to the Prophet is the sister, and is the sister of Adi, which is the daughter of Hatim. Adi fled to Syria. So the sister of Adi bin Hatim, which is, she is the sister of the leader of Tai, and she is the daughter of the uh, major leaders of Tai. When she was brought to Medina, she came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and she said, "Oh Messenger of Allah, my supporter is gone, and I don't have any more support or any more, you know, no one from my family to protect me, and I am an old woman." So please free me. So the Prophet ﷺ said to her, And who is your supporter? Who is your protector? So she said, Adi ibn Hatim, my brother. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Adi ibn Hatim, the one that ran away from Allah and his messenger. And then the Prophet ﷺ walked away. The next day she went to the Prophet ﷺ again. And she told him, Oh messenger of Allah, free me. My protector and supporter is gone. And I don't have any... One of my family left, and I'm an old woman, I need some protection, I need some support, I need some help. So the Prophet ﷺ replied back to her, the same reply as the previous day. Are you referring to Adi ibn Hatim, your brother, the one that ran away from Allah and his messenger? Then the third day she came to the Prophet ﷺ, and again she spoke to him the way she spoke in the previous two days. blocking someone? Okay. This is Toyota. What? Starlet. Okay. It's BCK 65F. Thanks, brother, for. I was down there waiting and no one came. Ya Allah, alhamdulillah. Khair. Tay. 
The next day, the third day she came to the Prophet Muhammad and she spoke to him the same as she spoke in the previous two days. Our messenger of Allah, my protector and supporter, is gone and I need someone to, uh, to free me. I need, I'm an old woman, I need some help, I need some support. So the Prophet والسلام, from his mercy and his generosity, he freed her. And Ali was there, so he told her, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he told her, ask the Prophet والسلام, since he had freed you, to send someone with you to take you back to your home. So the Prophet والسلام, also sent someone from his generosity, he sent someone to take her back home. So where did she go? She went and caught up with her brother Adi ibn Hatim, in Syria, when she arrived to Adi ibn Hatim, she told him, Oh brother, I met a man, he did a deed, he did an action that your own father would not even do. And who's his father? His father is Hatim al-Ta'i, a man that's known to be a man of nobility and man of generosity. When the Arabs speak about nobility and generosity, they speak about Hatim al-Ta'i. So the daughter of Hatim al-Ta'i told her brother, Adi, I just came from a man and I met a man. He done something to me that your own father would not even do. In other words, some, this man is so generous, more generous than your own father that people speak about. People sing poetry about your father and his generosity. Well, I met someone who is more generous than your father. And then she told him, go to the messenger of Allah, whether you like it or you don't. Go to him. Whether you want or you don't want, just go to the Messenger of Allah. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Adi ibn Hatim was considered to be to the Muslims as a, a fugitive. So anyone that will capture him, they will kill him. But Adi ibn Hatim, out of bravery, he came to the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam to Medina. My own sister, the daughter of Hatim al-Ta'i, she says, I met a man better than your own father. And who's my father, Adam al Tai? Obviously, the, my, yani, this is a testification coming uh, from someone who is really meaning what they're saying. So Adi came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he sat in front of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, he said, O oh Adi, become a Muslim and peace will be upon you. So he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I am a man of religion. I am a man of religion. So the Prophet ﷺ told him, I know of your religion more than you. And this is, shows you how much knowledge the Prophet ﷺ had. And not only just any knowledge, the Nabi ﷺ had knowledge of what's surrounding him. In which Adi used to follow a branched religion from Christianity. A branched religion, even Christians deny it. Like Christians don't even approve of that branch. It's called a rukusiya So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu had even knowledge of that of that religion, which is minority and made up by those people. So the Prophet sallallahu told him, "I know of your religion more than you." So Adi was amazed. Like he's never met someone that knows about their religion. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, "Yes, aren't you from the rukusiya Don't you follow that religion, the rukusiya and then the Prophet ﷺ said, And you had permitted what your own religion forbids. And Nabi Sallallahu wants to show him that not only I'm saying that, but I know about your religion more than you. He told him you had permitted something in religion that your own religion does not even allow. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said, You made people give you a quarter of their wealth under the name of your religion, even though your religion does not even tell you that. So when Adi heard that, he knew the Prophet ﷺ really knows what he's talking about. And the Prophet ﷺ said, that's not even permissible in your religion. So Adi said, yes, Messenger of Allah, what you're saying is true. So the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, he says, isn't it tough for you to say, La ilaha illallah? Do you believe there is someone else beside Allah? So he said, oh, Messenger of Allah, there is no one else beside Allah. And then he told him, do you believe Allah is the greatest? Do you know of anyone greater than Allah? He said, there is no one greater than Allah. And then he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. And then he started to come to the Prophet ﷺ every single day sitting down with the Prophet ﷺ wants to learn more. Then the Prophet ﷺ shared with him some of the unseen knowledge 
some of the future knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him, he told them, Oh Adi, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you long life to live, you'll see the Muslim female come all the way from the Hira, far away city, from Mecca. She will travel by herself. She does not fear no one but Allah. She'll come all the way to the Kaaba and visit the Kaaba. You know, obviously back then, a female would not travel by herself. What travel by herself in the middle of the desert, with, you know, it's just being alone is scary. And the high robbers, and there's no law, and there's no police. But the Prophet ﷺ told Adi, By Allah, if Allah gives you a long life to live, you will see that the Muslim female will migrate, or she will travel from Hira all the way to Mecca by herself. She does not fear no one but Allah. And then he said to him, O oh Adi, if Allah gives you long life to live, you'll also experience the jewelry of, of Khosrows. The Persian emperor, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the Muslims open Persia. And then told him, O oh Adi, if you live long enough to experience, you'll also see a man that will carry a handful of gold. His hands full of gold. Looking for someone to take it and no one will accept it from him. Everyone will be wealthy. When the Prophet ﷺ passed away, and before the death of Adi, he started to share that with the companions. And he said, By Allah, the Messenger of Allah told me if he had to live, if Allah gives you a long life to live, you'll experience the Muslim female migrating or traveling from Hira to Mecca. She does not fear no one but Allah. He said, By Allah, I experienced that. And he said, I was from amongst those who fought against the Persian emperor, Empire, and I was amongst those who saw the Persian Emperor Khosrow's collapse. So I saw the two things that the Prophet ﷺ told me. Yet, he said, yet I have not seen the third one the Prophet ﷺ told me, where you find a man with a handful of gold looking for someone to accept it, and no one will take it. And he passed away before that. But that came after him, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, during al Khilaf al Rashida, where people were wealthy, people were paying the zakat, and there was, there was, there were not, you know, there was uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala made everyone so wealthy and rich or content that there, there were not poor people to take the treasure or to take that wealth from anyone. So there, that was a very important event before the battle of Tabuk. In the ninth year of the Hijra which is two years before the death of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or less. One of the last and most important and largest expeditions took place during that time, which is the Battle of Tabuk. Tabuk is in the northwest of Saudi Arabia. After the opening and the conquest of Mecca, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a stronghold of the Arabian Peninsula. The Arabian Peninsula now is under the Islamic State. Now what are the borders between the Arabian Peninsula? The next borders are the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire had under a stronghold had Jordan, you could say, Syria, which is Bilad al-Sham, Palestine, Lebanon, all the way Turkey, and all the way through Europe. That was the state of the Roman Empire. A few lessons ago we spoke about the battle of Mu'tah and how the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, sent 3,000 Muslims to fight against an army of 100,000 of the Roman army. And how 3,000 by the will of Allah جل, did not lose but did not win. Both armies just retreated from one another. Now to the Romans that was a loss. You're talking about the greatest empire, the superpower back then, for them to stand against Arabs, which they used to treat as slaves, and not crush them, that's degrading to them, that's an embarrassment, that's humiliating. So what the Roman emperor did, Heraclius, he started to prepare an army to invade Medina and crush the, the army of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. With his Arab allies, in which he had a lot of Arabs living on the borders of the Roman Empire, they were allies to the Roman Empire. 
And there were Christians, especially the Ghassanis. So he put together an army that exceeded 40,000. And the news came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Heraclius is preparing an army to invade Medina and crush the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now during that time was a very crucial ordeal time for the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa sallam. It was an easy time. It was a time of drought. It was a very, very hot summer. And obviously they were traveling under the sun. And not only that, it was just time of harvesting the dates. So they wait the whole year to harvest the dates. And now the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is telling them, during time of drought, during time of heat, hot weather, and during time of harvesting the fruits and the dates, and Nabi Alayhi Salatu Wasallam now wants to call for jihad, and he wants to call the companions to go out to this not easy expedition, but an expedition that you are facing a superpower state such as the Roman Empire back then. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam thought about the condition that the companions are in. But at the same time, he looked at what's more important. Let the Romans come into the Arabian Peninsula, attack them in Medina, and all the hard work that the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions had done, let it go all through down the drain. Or let the companions sacrifice this season, sacrifice their lives, and let them stand against the Roman Empire, let them stand against the Romans and let them stand against those who are the allies of the Romans and let people still recognize the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a strong state and recognize that the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam is the one that people should resort to and go back to, to their political affairs and to their religion. So at the end, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided to march out of Medina going towards Tabuk to meet with the Roman, uh, Roman army and to fight against them. The news now are coming forward to the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, what the Roman emperor had prepared, 40,000 of his men, excluding the allies of the Arab and those who are Arab Christians allied to the Roman empire, which was a Christian empire then, and them coming to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to invade Medina, the companions were in a state of fear. The terror alert was high. That Umar ibn Khattab said that, you know, to the stage how, how high the terror alert was to the people of Mecca, that they were expecting the Romans to just come into Medina at, in, at any moment. Umar said, I had a companion that we used to share. One day he goes to listen to the Prophet Sallallahu and then I go the next day and we bring the news to one another because we're far away from the mosque of the Prophet Sallallahu so one day my neighbor went to hear from the Prophet Sallallahu then he came back and he knocked on my door so hard. So I came out. I'm going to say, I came out so scared and I said, did the Romans come? Did the Romans come? So they were in a position, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they were in a position of worry. When is the Roman Empire or when the Roman army will come in the Arabian Peninsula? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marched out of Medina with an army that's never ever been and never seen before by the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. This time with the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum, with the Bedouin tribes who embraced Islam, with the people of Mecca. Now the Islamic State is no longer Medina. It's Medina, Mecca and what's between and around Mecca and Medina. The Muslim army reached up to 30,000 soldiers. 30,000 soldiers. Just one year before that, when there were 12,000 of them, they thought they can't be defeated. Now, alhamdulillah, 30,000. Obviously, that's because of the expansion of the Muslim state and more people embraced Islam, especially after the conquest of Mecca. So now the Islamic state is no longer Medina. It's Medina, Mecca and the surrounding of Medina and Mecca. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came out in that tough situation, hard situation, where companions are preparing to start picking the fruits and picking the dates. They wait the whole year for it. Very hot season. And there was drought. So there was not much water. 
the last thing the the last thing they want it's list you know come out and start fighting in the path of Allah but at the end of the day when it comes for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nothing should make them hesitate all the companions came out and those who believe in Allah azza wa jal and believe in the messenger of Allah except munafiqin hypocrites and there was over 80 of them who made up excuses why they couldn't participate in the expedition with the Prophet Sallallahu And except some companions who wanted to come with the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam and attend with him, but they did not have, they did not have money or did not have weapons or did not have horses to participate with the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam. So the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam could not carry them with him because he doesn't have, where are you gonna come? Don't have weapons. You don't have a horse, you don't have a camel. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran Kareem, La ajidu ma ahmilukum alayhi tawalla wa ayinum tafidu min ad dami ayinum tafidu min ad dami hasanan Allah yajidu Allah yajidu ma yunfiqun. Allah spoke about them how they walked away from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam crying and weeping, why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam couldn't take him with them, with him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They were crying why they couldn't participate in the expedition and how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could not carry them with him Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. I carry with what? And he went out alayhi salatu was salam. 18 people were sharing one camel. 30,000 companions in that trip. 18 companions to share one camel. So can you wait in line for 18 people in front of you to share that camel? And I calculated that ended to be 1,666 camels. For what? For 30,000 Soldiers, you know, that's that's the ability that the Prophet ﷺ had. But then the Prophet ﷺ, before coming out, Nabi Sallallahu knew the situation and the lack of weaponry and lack of money. So Alayhi Salatu started to encourage the companions, even though they are going through tough moments within themselves. And Nabi Alayhi Salatu started to encourage them to donate whatever they can donate in the path of Allah to prepare this army. So the companions did not hesitate to donate whatever they can donate. And they gave the greatest examples in that. Uthman radiallahu ta'ala was preparing 200 camels with its stock to go to Syria to trade and come back with its profits. But he turned it back, bringing it back to Medina and he donated that in the path of Allah. Then he came back to the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam with another 200 camels. Carried with stocks and weaponry. And he said, this is for Sabilillah. Then he came back with a large amount of silver and gold. Given it to the Prophet ﷺ. Then he came back again with another hundred camels. Then he came back again with a thousand dinar to the Prophet ﷺ. And put it in front of the Prophet ﷺ. Until it reached to 900 camels. You know, 900 camels. And camels back then are not cheap. Imagine that you donate 900 cars, good cars. He donated 900 camels. And not only the camels, and what the camels carry, and the saddles of the camels, and the stocks, and weaponry, and money. And the Prophet ﷺ is grabbing the money that Uthman donated, and he said, Today, nothing will ever harm Uthman or whatever he does. After all this, nothing will ever harm Uthman after what he does. And Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, another companion, came with some of his money, large amount of money, giving it to the Prophet. Umar ibn Khattab said, Today is my day, I want to be Abu Bakr. So he came with half of his wealth. You know, something that doesn't happen. Usually these days, when you tell someone donate, the first thing they look, okay, is that what I don't need? Yalla, fi sabilillah. Who does these days on half of my wealth? Take, this is half my wealth, or quarter of my wealth. Umar ibn al-Khattab came with half of his wealth thinking, today is my day. Today I'm going to be Abu Bakr. But he was shocked to see that Abu Bakr was there before him, not with half of his wealth. But Abu Bakr was there before him with all his wealth, radiallahu ta'ala. So when the Prophet والسلام, looked at Abu Bakr, and Abu Bakr said, oh messenger of Allah, this is all my wealth is in front of you. 4,000 dinar. And 4,000 is a lot of money. You know, if someone's got 100 bucks and that's all, I've got 100 dollars, I'll come and say, this is all my worth. It means nothing. But when you've got 2, 3 million dollars and you say, look, here's the 2, 3 million dollars for Sabila. That's when he said, that's a sacrifice. 
So Abu Bakr had a lot of wealth and he came with all his wealth. And he puts it forward to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, Oh Messenger of Allah, he's all my wealth. So the Messenger of Allah asks him and tells him, Oh Abu Bakr, if he came with all your wealth, what did you leave for your family and your children? So Abu Bakr says, Oh Messenger of Allah, I left him something better. What's that? Allah and his Messenger. I left for my family Allah and his Messenger. Is there anything better than Allah and his Messenger? Is this wealth and the wealth of this whole world equivalent to Allah and his Messenger? Well, all Messenger of Allah, I left Allah and his Messenger with my family. Look at the iman, the yaqeen they had. That, that purity, that sincerity, that faith they had for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the love of his Messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And many other companions. And not only that, the female companions, whatever they had from jewelry and gold, they sent it to the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. Even some poor companions probably had a few dollars. And they came and brought it to the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. Like they did not hesitate to even contribute, even if it's a dollar. So what did the munafiqeen, the hypocrites do? They start to look at him and say, you bring in a dollar, a date and two. What's that going to do to 30,000 soldiers? They were mocking them, making a mockery of them. They were laughing at them saying, what, who are you bringing a dollar or half a dollar or a date or a gram of gold? What's that going to do to an army? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran al-Kareem, الَّذِينَ يَلْمِزُونَ الْمُطَّوِعِينَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فِي الصَّدَقَاتِ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَجِدُونَ إِلَّا جُهُدًا فَيَسْخَرُونَ مِنْهُمْ سَخِرَ اللَّهُ مِنْهُمْ Those who are making mockery of those companions who are only bringing whatever they could bring for the sake of Allah, whatever they could sacrifice. They're giving something for the sake of Allah. They are making mockery. Allah is the one that's making mockery of them. You look down at them, Allah is the one that will look down at you. Whatever you give for Allah Azza wa Jal, even if it's little, will be great in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this shows the great contribution of the companions when it comes for the sake of Allah, they don't hesitate. When it's for Allah Azza wa Jal, there's no turning back. When it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my wealth, my family, this is all becomes secondary. Allah Azza wa Jal is the most important thing to me in my life. And this is where we lack understanding in our lives. Everything else is primary and our religion is secondary. Our religion is always coming last. Our religion is something that when we have time for, we give. Our religion is something that when we have money to donate for it, we give. But the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, religion was never a secondary. And religion was always primary and number one important thing in their life. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam assigned Muhammad ibn Maslama radiallahu ta'ala anhu to look after the affairs of Medina. And he left Ali ibn Abi Talib to look after his family. So the Prophet sallallahu left Ali ibn Abi Talib to look after his own family. So Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu got upset. Oh, Messenger of Allah, you're going to leave me behind and miss out on this great participation, this great expedition, in this great moment to please Allah Azza wa Jal. So the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam said, Oh Ali, wouldn't you accept to be in the position of Harun to Musa, but there's no Prophet after me? Wouldn't you accept to be in the position of Harun to Musa? Like me, like my second... Be my, my right hand man. Be the one with me. Be like someone who assists me. Wouldn't you accept that? But there's no prophet after me. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made it clear. There's no prophet after me. So people later on say the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ah, Ali was like Harun. That means he is a prophet and a messenger. And Nabi Alayhi Salatu Wasallam from his hikmah he said, There's no prophet after me. But Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala inshallah will give you the great rewards. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marched out on Thursday alayhi salatu wa salam in the month of Muharram. Uh, in the, uh, in, 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 on Thursday in this month of Muharram, uh, the ninth year of the Hijrah towards Tabuk. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had 30,000 fighters with him alayhi salatu wa salam. And alayhi salatu wa salam did not have much of prepared weapons and prepared preparation for the army. And they had 18 people sharing one camel. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued to march. The companions spoke about the heat of the weather, how hot it was, and how hungry they became. 
They were eating the leaves of the trees that their tongues and their lips became, you know, bruised and, and became very painful for them. And not only that, because of their thirst, they resorted to the necessity of slaughtering camels so they could drink some of the water that's left in the guts of the camels. To that extent. But this is the test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested them with. And then the bigger test comes is when they went and reached to the place of, Sa- of, the, of Salih, the, the tribe of Thamud. How Allah azza wa destroyed them because of their pride. And there was a well of water there. So the companions when they saw the well of water, they went to the well of water and they started to drink from it. And they start to cook from it. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, how could you use a water of a well out of a city that Allah azza wa demolished and Allah azza wa cursed? So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, throw out and pour out any water that you gain from that well. And never enter these cities early that you enter crying or you make yourself cry. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa walked away. And he said, whatever food you cooked from that water, you feed it to your camels and you feed it to your mounts and animals. Why? Because it's a city that Allah Azza wa Jal had cursed. It's a city that Allah Azza wa Jal sent His wrath upon. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Do not, do not enter these cities unless you are crying or weeping, or you just trans- transit, just going through it, and then stay there. Or else, be aware that the same wrath that Allah sent on them will follow you. This is what the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam said. Then the Prophet Muhammad Alayhi Salatu Wasallam continued, and the companions came, complained to the Prophet ﷺ about the thirst and about the heat, about the hot weather. So Nabi ﷺ asked Allah Azza wa Jal to make things easy on his army. So Allah sent a cloud that protected them from the sun and it started to rain. In a time which is not raining, you know, in the, in the Arabian Peninsula, you'll be lucky to get rain during winter. How about summer? So the rain came down upon them and they drank from it and the, the, the animals drank from it, their camels drank from it and alhamdulillah the spirit came back to the companions and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he said tomorrow will arrive to Tabuk and there's a spring of water there. Whoever gets to Tabuk before us do not go near that spring of water until I get there. So the companions heard that but two companions managed to get there before the Prophet ﷺ, and there was that spring of water the Prophet ﷺ spoke about and was leaking a bit of water, drips of water, dots of water coming down from that spring. So those two companions couldn't grab themselves from the thirst so they drank from it. So the Prophet ﷺ told them, didn't I tell you not to drink from it? And then the Prophet ﷺ gave them the advice. Then the Prophet ﷺ himself drank from it. And because of the blessings of the Prophet ﷺ, from drops dripping out of the spring into the spring floating, flowing water that the companions start to drink from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the spring flow a lot more water than just drips of water coming down. Then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam told the companions tonight is going to be a strong and heavy wind. No one get up. So the companions at night all stayed and when the heavy wind came, they all stayed where they are, except one of them. He got up, the wind caught him and threw him at one of the mountains. And this all information, all this is knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Now the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam is at Tabuk. And Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam is now waiting for the Romans. Where are they? We are here. You want to fight us? We're here. 30,000 companions. 30,000 Muslim soldiers, something that that number rarely to exist early within the Persian or the Roman empires. Beside them, who would get 30,000 people? But Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard of the marching of the people of Rome. The Romans had the coming from Rome and with their allies to come and attack the Muslims and the companions in the Arabian Peninsula and Medina. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went out there and he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came face to face to them. You want to face me? I'll come face to face to you. So he stood there alayhi salatu wasalam tabuk, waiting for 10 nights and 10 days for the Romans to arrive. But when the Romans got the news that Muhammad came with 30,000 of his men, and Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam managed to arrive to tabuk before them, Allah casted the fear and the terror in their hearts, 
and they split amongst themselves and divided and their allies ran away from them and the Romans had no other choice except to retreat and go back to Rome. So Alhamdulillah was a victory for the Prophet ﷺ, even though he did not fight. But just to show and prove a point that Muhammad and his army is coming and Muhammad and his army are staying and Muhammad and his army are willing and Muhammad and his army are standing. So this, the battle of Tabuk, was a great victory for the Prophet ﷺ and the companions, even though they did not fight. But against who? Against the Roman Empire. You know, Muhammad والسلام, a man that just established a state a few years ago, not even a decade yet, and now he stands in front of the greatest empires, and the greatest empires retreat and run away from him. That sends a very strong and powerful political uh, message to every single person at that time around the Prophet ﷺ. And what happened? Because of that, a lot of the allies that allied with the Romans, Romans came and allied with themselves with the Prophet ﷺ. They saw, they saw, you know, these people at the end of the day want protection. So when they saw the stance of the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims, they came and allied themselves with the Prophet ﷺ and they gave the place to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had signed a lot of treaties between him and a lot of those who were living on the borders of the Arabian Peninsula because the, the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam or the Islamic State shared borders with the, with the Romans. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa needed to have allies there protecting the backs of the Muslims. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came back to Medina victorious after 50 days. 10 days staying in Tabuk and the rest of the 40 days traveling, going and coming. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu when he arrived to Medina, he saw the mountain of Uhud and he saw the city of Medina. He said, this is Taba. And he looked at the mountain of Uhud and says, this is the mountain of Uhud, a mountain that we love and loves us. A mountain that we love and loves us. And all the companions who were left behind came out to welcome the Prophet sallallahu and welcome the companions and the Muslims, uh, Muslim army, victorious, glory, happy, and proud of them coming back. And uh, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, whenever he used to come back from an expedition, he وسلم, used to begin the first thing, is to attend the mosque and pray to Raqqa. Then he'll sit down, and then he'll ask, where are those who did not attend with us? What was your reason? So Nabi وسلم, attended the mosque, sat down. And then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after he prayed the two rak'ah, he sat down. And then he starts, people know, what's your reason that he didn't come with us? Over 80 or so munafiqeen, hypocrites came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Each one of them has the excuse, all lying. But Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has the responsibility to deal with people from the outside. Oh, Messenger of Allah, I couldn't attend because my wife is sick. My son was sick, I was ill, I didn't have this. When Nabi Sallallahu he made this tighfar for them, and he said, I'll leave you to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And there was others, they couldn't attend because of genuine excuse. Amongst the rest, there was only three believers, who are true believers, sincere believers, who did not attend and did not have an excuse. One of them, his name is Ka'b ibn Malik, wa Murar ibn Rabi' wa Hilal ibn Umayyah. Those three companions are true, sincere companions. Love Allah and His Messenger, but they had no excuse for not attending or participating with the Prophet ﷺ. And when the Prophet ﷺ was on the expedition, and the companions used to tell the Prophet ﷺ about this person and that person, him himself, himself ﷺ, used to ask about companions when he doesn't see them. He knows every single one. Where is Fulan? Where is Fulan? Why isn't he with us? So Nabi alayhi salatu was in some statements he used to say about those who did not attend. He says, he said, leave them. If there's khair, if there's good in them, Allah will bring them with us. And if there's no good in them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prevented them away from us. But these three companions are different. And Nabi Sallallahu knows they were sincere companions. So Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is sitting down. And one of those three companions will come to the Prophet ﷺ and let him share his story with us. His name is Ka'b ibn Malik. He says, 
I was from amongst those who did not participate in the battle of Tabuk. And I participated with the Prophet ﷺ in all battles except the battle of Badr, which he gave us the choice to participate or not. I was also from amongst those who gave bay'ah to the Prophet ﷺ in Aqaba. I always stood with the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet ﷺ called to participate in the battle of Tabuk, by Allah, I was never ever more richer, healthier, better situation that I was ever in than that time. He's admitting, I've never been in any better situation than what I was in the battle of Tabuk. And when I heard people preparing themselves to go out and march with the Prophet ﷺ, I continued to say, I'll delay myself tomorrow and after tomorrow. Until the day that people marched out, I said, you know what, I'll prepare today or tomorrow and I'll catch up with them. But day after day, I realized that it's too late, so I stayed behind. And he says, by Allah, in the absence of the Prophet, in the absence of the Prophet والسلام, and the companions, while I'm walking in Medina, the only people I could see is either elderly people, who could not participate with the Prophet Sallallahu or a munafiq that everyone knows is a munafiq. What am I doing amongst these people? He's asking himself, what am I doing amongst these people, you know? I'm a man that believes in Allah and His Messenger. Why didn't I participate with the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam? And then he says, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came back, I thought about coming and speaking to the Prophet Sallallahu making up a lie. Make up an excuse. And he said, but Allah, I am a man that knows how to make up excuses. But then I said, how can I make up an excuse? Maybe Allah Azza wa will embarrass me. So when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrived to the mosque, and he sat down and people are coming, excusing themselves why they didn't participate with him. I came in front of the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ smiled to me in an angry way. He's giving me an angry smile. And he said, Ta'al, come here, O Ka'b ibn Malik. So I came and knew the Prophet ﷺ. And he said that the news came to me that the Prophet ﷺ asked about me while he was in Tabuk. Where is Ka'b ibn Malik? So one of the men got up, he said, he is sitting down comfortably with his wife in his farm. So Mu'adh got up, he said, oh, Messenger of Allah, this man is a liar. Wallahi, I only know good about Ka'b ibn Malik. So he sat down with the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam told him, why did you stay behind? Why didn't you participate with us? He said, oh, Messenger of Allah, I'm going to be straight honest with you. I'm going to be straightforward with you. Wallahi, I've never been in a better situation than I have ever experienced than this time. And if we want, I could make up excuses, but I know the truth is much more, much more important to me. O oh, Messenger of Allah, I have no excuse. I'll be straightforward. I have no excuse why I did not participate with you. And I'm scared if I'm going to lie, Allah will embarrass me. So I'd rather be straightforward from now. So the Prophet ﷺ told the companion, see this man? He's been honest with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but let Allah make the decision on him. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, get up. No one speak to this man. He was boycotted by everyone. And the Prophet ﷺ said, this man and the other, three compa- the other two companions who were honest with the Prophet ﷺ said, well, their decision is with Allah azza wa jal. From now till Allah azza wa says his decision, we do not speak to them. No one is allowed to talk to this man. He said, he's narrating the story, I walked out, a lot of people from my family, from my tribe came up to me and said, why didn't you make up an excuse to, to the Prophet Sallallahu Why didn't you make up something? Look at the embarrassment. Now you've been boycotted by the messenger of Allah and by the companions. He said, they continued talking to me until I started to think about going to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and lying to him. Then I said, no, I'm going to stick to the truth. So he walked. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam ordered all the companions to boycott him. He says about himself, after 40 days, when no one is talking to me, I will go to the market and try and smile to people and everyone just turns their faces away from me. I even entered the mosque of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. 
I'll see the Prophet ﷺ, you know, I'm here. And the Prophet ﷺ doesn't even look at me. And then when I got past him, I say, Salaamu Alaikum. He's narrating the story, he said, I started there, did the lips of the Prophet ﷺ move and say, Alaikum as -salam. And then after 40 days, Amen, from the Messenger of the Messenger of Allah, and the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi sent him to knock on my door. I thought, Alhamdulillah, here comes the solution, here comes the decision from Allah. But it was a man that was sent by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi to me to tell my wife to leave me. Not only your wife is to leave you. So he asked, I told the man, do I divorce her? He said, no, no, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi told you to leave her and tell your wife to go back to her family. Not to divorce, but let your wife boycott you. Even his wife. And he was willing to divorce her for the sake of Allah. But and Nabi Sallallahu said, told her to get to her family. He said, let her get to her family. So I told my wife, get to my family. And he said, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, wallahi, I felt even the ground that I'm walking on, I can't even recognize it anymore. No one wants to talk to him anymore. And he said, I came past my cousin, very close cousin of mine, that I was walking past his house. So I told him, oh cousin, do you believe I'm from amongst those who love Allah and his messenger? So my cousin said, Allah and his messenger know better. He said, I start to cry. Even my cousin, the closest one, you doubting my love to Allah and his messenger? He said, by Allah, I've never experienced days like this in my life. And then he said, after 50 days, what happened during those 50 days? Look at the test of Allah. One of the leaders under the Roman emperor heard what the Prophet ﷺ did to him. So he sent him a messenger with a letter saying to him, I heard that your mate Muhammad is turning away from you. Come to us and we'll look after you. Look at the test. He said, come to us, we'll look after you. He said, by Allah, I threw it in the oven. Let it burn. And then he said, after filth, everyone is turning away from me. No one wants to talk to me. I go to the mosque, I say, salam alaikum. I doubt people are replying the salam back to me. The Prophet ﷺ said to boycott me. Him and the other companions. He said, until the fifth day, 50, 50th day, in which I was praying on my roof, praying Fajr prayer, and remembering Allah Azza wa Jal. And then I hear a rush, people running, coming to my house. So someone comes to me and says, be happy for the most happiest day in your life. Allah Azza wa Jal had accepted your repentance. Be happy for the most happiest day in your life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had accepted your repentance. He said, but Allah, I got so happy. I was prostrated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and took off my garment and gave it to this man. I had no other garment except that garment. Then I went and borrowed another garment from my friends to go and meet the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. I ran into the mosque of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and the Prophet is smiling. Alayhi salatu wasalam smiling. He said, by Allah, his face is like a full moon. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, be happy for the most happiest day. That the, the, for the most happiest day you've ever experienced from the day your, mom, your mother gave birth to you. Be happy for the most happiest day that you, uh, the, for, for the happiest day that you've ever experienced uh, from the day your mother gave birth to you. And then he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, did Allah send this repentance down that he accepts my repentance or is it you? So he said, No, Allah is the one that accepted your repentance. And then he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, let me donate my wealth. I want to donate all my wealth for the sake of Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, keep some for yourself and donate whatever you want to donate. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned in the Quran al-Kareem, وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا حَتَّى إِذَا ضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهُمُ الْأَرْضُ بِمَا رَحُبَتْ Allah speaking about those three men, three companions, that did not participate in the expedition, and the, the, the ground, the, the land was becoming... Undistinguishable to them. They could not, Allah describes it that they could not even walk on the, on the ground anymore. They could not even walk on, the, you know, on, on earth anymore because everyone was just turning away from them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how Allah accepted their repentance. And the whole companions start to hug those three companions and you know, congratulating them for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepting their repentance. And then Allah Azza wa Jalla revealed in the Quran, Kareem, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, attaqu Allah wa kunu 
الصادقين, all those who believe, fear Allah and be from amongst those who say truth. Be from amongst those who say truth. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, الصدق ينجي, truthfulness saves. والكذب يهلك, a lying destroys. And this companion says, by Allah, my best experience was ever to know that being honest, no matter what it is, it is greater than making an excuse. At that year, also other great events took place in which uh, other events took place, such as the death of Najashi, uh, the negus of uh, the uh, Ethiopian emperor uh, king who passed away and the Prophet ﷺ prayed on him. Also that year, the head of the Munafiqeen, Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul, passed away. And he passed away and the Prophet ﷺ made istighfar for him and he prayed on him. So Umar ibn Khattab came to him and he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, how could you pray on Munafiq? So the Prophet ﷺ did what he did. So Allah revealed in the Quran Kareem, then pray on a Munafiq anymore. And during that time, the Munafiqeen, what they wanted to do is they wanted to split and divide amongst the Muslims. So they established a mosque by the name of Dirar, which means harmful. And the reason they established that mosque is because they wanted to split and divide amongst the lines of the companions and the ranks of the companions. And they asked the Prophet ﷺ to come and pray in that mosque. Because if he prays in, in it, that means he approves of it. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Prophet ﷺ that he, does, he destroys that mosque. Why? Because that mosque was not established for the sake of Allah. It was established to cause division amongst the Muslims. It was established to bring harm to the Muslim ummah. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu demolished that mosque and then we come close to the last and final moments of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu which next week inshaAllah we'll talk about the Hajj of Abu Bakr and then how people start to embrace Islam and then the last moments of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu We ask Allah to make us from amongst those who listen and hear, act upon what they listen and hear. Subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, nashadu wa laila, and tastafu wa tubu To listen to or download more Islamic lectures, please visit www.islamicmedia.com.au